1003, and we want to welcome you all to a series on uh, technology for leaders. And it's a, uh, we have a three series set for, for that's going to be brought to you by Adafio. They're uh, a leading provider of, uh, of services in the IT arena. I'm going to read to you a little introduction about two of the two people that will be presenting. But before I do, I want to thank Melissa Swan, the marketing director for Adafio, for being such a good uh, marketing person and hooking us up and getting us to know each other. It's a long story about that, but she was very patient and good. And we're so glad that we've gotten to know Adafio. And uh, our presenters are Keith Woodruff and Jeremy Osborne. Keith joined Adafio over 10 years ago as president and CEO, recently transitioned to his current role as chief technical technology officer in Northwest Arkansas's managing partner in 2020. He and I, did we win that golf tournament we played the other day? I can't remember. Keith, I think, no, we let him, someone else win it, didn't we? He's a pretty good golfer. Uh, and we're really glad to have him moving up here to Northwest Arkansas. Uh, yeah, we had a lot of fun, though. It was a beautiful day. It was great to be it? out. Wasn't it? Yeah. I, I learned how much work I needed on my drives. That's why I'm oh, doing likewise. Pilates. <laughs> I'm doing Pilates, Keith, so I'm going to be all limbered up here soon. Uh, Jeremy is the Chief Information Security Officer and Cybersecurity Advocate with Adafio since 2015. He's a certified information security professional, certified ethical hacker, and a licensed penetration tester with almost 20 years of professional IT experience. Certified ethical hacker, how about that? Adafio Technology Partners is the largest Arkansas-based managed, ser managed service provider, operating one of the most extensive groups of IT engineers and specialists in the region. They help build, support, and protect their clients, businesses through implement, implementing and optimizing IT consulting and management, cloud computing so solutions, cybersecurity and healthcare consulting across multiple industries from their offices in central and northwest Arkansas. Adafio is driven by and owe their success to living their core values, which begin with their commitment to client success. And they, if you were to Google them, they, you would find they're a winner of some of the best companies to work for and best companies in, uh, in the press from, you know, people like Arkansas Business. So they're really, really well thought of by the, by the state of Arkansas. And um, uh, anything else, we are recording this. We do have a series of, of three, three set series. The next one will be utilizing the, the, the cloud for, for your strategic benefit. Uh, that's not exactly the words, but... Uh, and um, and uh, I guess from this, I will introduce you and turn this over to Keith, and, uh, and you take it away, and we'll go from there. Well, thanks for that gracious introduction, Tim, and we're really privileged to be able to um, share this with you today. Thanks for car carving time out of your busy schedules to spend uh, an hour plus with us. Um, this cybersecurity space is just red hot. I think it's impacted. Um, so many companies and even as you we all read here recently in the paper even the u.s treasury department's been a victim of russian hackers so um, i'm gonna uh, we have a slide that talks about uh, our core values but let's roll right into letting jeremy talk and share with you about um, what we have scheduled for you so jeremy i'll turn it over to you absolutely thank you um to bear with me here just one second evidently i forgot to set a setting on zoom that's going to allow me to share this screen you may have to hack yourself to get get to it huh? <laughs> i'm thinking maybe right. oh and it's going to make me that is not good it's going to make me drop zoom and come back so keith are you in a position where you could share the deck instead I believe I am. Let's see if I can do that. So it wouldn't be a presentation without at least one technical snag, right? That's right. That's right. Well, let's see. Share screen. Uh, host disabled participant screen sharing. So I cannot do that at this moment. Let's, let's, uh, let's see if I can trick this thing. A little Jeremy, bit. yours is up. Oh, ah, yeah. there we go. Is that forward or backwards for everyone? Forward. It's looks fine. Good. Looks good. Very good. Very good. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and just. Okay. And Jeremy, you might want to cover whether you're okay with asking questions during, or, or you want to wait till the end to the end of the presentation. You and I yes, talked about that. 
Yeah, so that is a uh, that's a great segue there. I have a uh, I have a tendency to be a, a, a bit interactive, so please feel free to uh, feel free to interrupt. Feel free to you know speak up. If you have any questions or if you want to dig deeper into a subject. I, uh, I get a little excited at times. I'm a little plain spoken. I get a little excited and start moving a little quickly. So if, you, if you'd like for me to you know, back up, recover anything else, uh, if you have any questions or would like to in inject a, uh, a comment, please feel free to do so. This should be as interactive as you guys want. Um, I'd, I'd like for everybody to get out of this what, you, what, you know, what you're interested in. Thank you. All right. So having said that, um, thank you. Thank you guys very much for the opportunity to go over this with you and, and to present some of uh, some of Adafio's ideas around technology and security for executives. We've got our, uh, our, our, uh, our biography slides in here. We, we kind of went through those, so I'll skip past those. Keith referred to, you know, Adafio's core values. We believe that core values are extremely important for organizations, right? And on the screen, you should see Adafio's three core values that we're committed to our client success, that we, we practice unquestionable integrity and one team with humility and respect. It, it wouldn't be an Adafio presentation without us covering these. And as Tim Kindly, kindly said there. I've got a bit of an alphabet soup after my name. I've I've been in the industry for for quite a while. Uh, I'm a technologist by by history, so um, you know I have a tendency to be a little technical in some of the some of the things that I speak about. But we're we're going to just kind of dig into this today. I'd like first to go over kind of four different concepts, right? Four concepts that that we think effective leaders are, need to consider, right? When you're getting ready for a site for your cybersecurity journey. It, you know, it's, and it, it's our hope that you can walk away with at least a couple of ideas from today that, about things that, that may be impactful to you or your organizations. First, we're gonna start by talking about, you know, at a real high level, we're gonna take a look at some, some of the common threats that, are, that enterprises are being exposed to today. And then we're going to try to look at some well-known paradigms that kind of play out in, in cybersecurity. I'll try to look at those with a little bit of a different perspective. Then we're going to look at some of the things that we can do to help define and encourage, you know, the, our corporate cultures. You know, specifically to try to get the culture itself to adopt some of those, those cyber assumptions that should help keep everybody in the organization safe. And then finally, we want to get in some of the practical activities that you, as a leader, might need to care about, right? Making sense so far? So we'll just go ahead and dig straight in here. We're going to talk about some of the common threats. As you guys know, there are a myriad of, of threats out in the world. There's malicious actors and attackers that are they're just coming at us all day, every day. Many organizations find themselves kind of playing whack-a-mole, right? You know, looking for point solutions. And this might show it you know, might show itself by the technologists that work inside of your organizations looking for those point solutions and trying to find that, you know, that infamous silver bullet solution that's going to solve all your security problems, right? You know, can I get an MDR? Can I get, you know, uh, can I put vulnerability in place? You know, can, um, I get a little lost here. You'll have to excuse me while I, uh, while I burn off some of this excess adrenaline early in the conversation. So, what we thought might be interesting is to kind of tie this idea around all these different areas of threats that are that malicious actors are using to attack your organizations. You know, uh, I'm, I'm sure you guys have heard many of these, you know, the business email compromise, the wire fraud transfers, things like ransomware taking over and, and, and having to pay Bitcoin ransoms to, to get your data back. And we, we found a, a short about four, four and a half minute video we'd like to share with you guys that kind of tie all this together and, and present to you one scenario that, that we've seen play out and that can play out. So hopefully my technology is going to work here today and I'll be able to flip over to this screen. All right, I should still be spotlighted. Now, this video may play a little quietly, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to mute myself. If you need to, please feel free to, uh, uh, to turn your volume up 
and then I'll give you just a heartbeat after the video plays to turn the volume back down so I don't blow out your eardrums. How did you decide to become a hacker? Well, I'm not really sure what it means to become a hacker. That's like some guy in a hoodie who types really fast and stays up all night writing code and cracking passwords. It's not me. I just spy on people and see what makes them click. It's not a bad job. Mark Hanning, CEO of Qualicard, said to report earnings after their blockbuster IP. So you consider this a job? I put a lot of work into this. I'm not lazy. It takes research to figure out the key players, learn all about them, their families, their friends, what they care about. You have to understand the company's organization. I get a lot of my information from the sales department because they're always so quick and eager. They're hungry. People trust too easily. They don't look at the details. I do. Details matter. That's what I'm good at. It has to look completely believable. It has to look familiar. This is where research is important. It's not some generic piece of spam. It's an email from their boss with their company signature. It's written in the voice of the boss. It's what he would say if he were writing this. What about the malware itself? How does that work? Somebody else out there already wrote all the code that does the actual attack. I'm just using it in the attachment. My skill is in my ability to get a bunch of people to click on that attachment. I always wonder what it's like when the whole thing unfolds on their end, when the panic sets in. Please leave your message after the beep. Hey, this is Rajiv in finance. Call me as soon as you get this. Something's up with my laptop. I can't hey, are you going to wait in the office? Something's going on with our file uh, server. It's uh, Karen in HR. Our, our benefits dashboard's being really slow. We're getting calls from users on it. Can you call and get this? Joking conference now. Currently, there's a malware attack targeting our main... It ran from where? They're holding us hostage. We're locked out of everything. I, I can't even check my phone. What about the backup? That will take days. We need this fixed now. Just pay it. We don't have a choice. We're reporting earnings in two hours. But how do we know Just that they'll... pay it. Put every single person on getting us back up and running. That's the only priority now. Okay, it's done. I have the decrypt key. We have a big problem. The ransomware was just to distract us. They got inside. They got everything. Customer data, financials, everything. Qualicard is reeling today from the news that hackers have released the personal information of nearly The Nasdaq million. closed lower today, led by Qualicard, which was down 14% on news that their recent data breach may be far worse. Company the stock fell to a new all-time low on news that CEO Mark Hanning is stepping down after what is turning out to be one of the worst breaches of personal information in recent history. Do you feel bad about releasing the personal information? All the financials? All the money that was lost? All I did was get the files. I'm not the one that decided to release them. I'm not the one that shorted the stock. Somebody else had their reasons for that. It's above my pay grade. I was paid to do a job, and I did it well. And that's what's expected of anyone, isn't it? Anyway, markets bounce back. So hopefully you guys were able to hear that okay. All right. So what do you guys think? Anything there kind of strike you? It was nice to see it from the eyes and the mind of a hacker. I, it was a great uh, lesson in um, how this all can transpire so quickly. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's that's probably the the biggest thing that I, I I'd like for you guys to take away from that video, right? I mean, you're chaining all these 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 threats together, right? She talks quite a bit about uh, 
well, she didn't really talk a, a lot about that, but I guess the, the point I'm trying to make is that the, the attacker and the hacker mentality and mindset really is a bit different and a bit alien to a lot of our corporate thinking. Mm -hmm. right? The ethos is really different and there is, there is a lot of, don't know how to really say it, but there's a lack of concern about the outcomes of their actions, right? So that's, that's one of the reasons we call them malicious attackers as opposed to just hackers, right? The hacker thought process is, you know, one of curiosity historically. So we think that the term malicious attacker is a better term to use than a hacker. One so, without empathy, right? <laughs> absolutely. I mean, she did her job well. Right? Yeah. She got paid for it. That's mm -hmm. all we can all hope for. So what do we think about moving into the idea of, of the philosophy of cyber management, right? Cybersecurity management philosophy itself. Well, we, if we take that old adage of reactive versus proactive, I'm sure that we've all heard this before, right? The more proactive you can get, the better that you're going to be because you're anticipating your needs. Right. So yeah, it's our it's our old friend. Action is better than reaction. You know, we're transitioning from this reactive to a proactive cybersecurity. It involves these these incremental enhancements to your existing strategy. So cybersecurity isn't something that you can just plop in and be done. There is no silver bullet for cybersecurity for an organization. What there is is there is incremental maturity. You pick one thing and you try to put it in play. So as I'm sure you notice, there's a lot of there's a lot of program talk in this in this slide, right? When you're talking about reactive, you're talking about things like password resets, blocking IPs. You're talking about monitoring. I mean, you're playing whack-a-mole, right? I, I love what you said there, Tim, in in the chat. So as you begin to move and morph yourself and your organization into this proactive, you're going to start noticing that there's a lot of program talk in here, right? There's a lot of of preparing for things. And what we found time and again is that being aware and prepared, it materially reduces the damage of security incidents to your organization, right? So that's financially, that's reputation wise, that's the impact to your, to your personnel, the stress that these incidents cause in order to respond to them well and to be worried about the healthy organization. I mean, there's lots of different areas that a proactive approach can help you prevent, right? It's almost like insurance in a way, right? Mm -hmm. And one of the things I I'd, I'd like for us to take away from this is, you know, for leaders like us, it's not necessarily effective for us to be deeply involved in the technology, deeply involved in the solutions, but what is but what we can empower ourselves to do and what is ex extremely impactful, right? Is to find those people and champion them that are passionate about things that are important to our cybersecurity journey. Those things are like, if you hear people talking about stuff like disk encryption and security awareness, multi-factor authentication, right? If you hear people talking about risk management and cybersecurity risk assessments, vulnerability scanning, managed detection and response, right? Business continuity and disaster recovery planning. If you're hearing people in your organization talk about those types of things, those are the ones you want to pay attention to. Those are the folks, those are going to be your key players, right? Those are the people that you want to, you want to talk to their leaders and you want to find a way to champion them. You want to find a way to empower them appropriately, right? You don't want to spend too much at it, but you want to, you want to enable those, that conversation to begin. Make sense? Does. So that's quite a bit that we've been over there, right? So now that I've kind of exhausted you all and overwhelmed you with way too many details on that last slide and that, that conversation, I, I'd, I'd like to kind of take a step back and I thought it might be helpful for us to quickly kind of run through a couple of examples of what a proactive approach might look like. 
right? Let's say that one of those one of those folks we were just talking about that's passionate about this stuff comes up to you, or or presents to you in, in a meeting this fact, right? What do we do? What do you think we should do if you learn that multi-factor authentication can solve up to 99.9% .9 of your accounts being compromised? What would you do? We, right, you'd probably want to you'd probably want to implement it widespread in your organization. Absolutely, right? So, you know, putting the MFA in place now that we're all kind of on, on the on the same page there, let's go through a couple more of these. The Verizon Data Breach report says that 90% of email malware is distributed via macros. What should we do there? Probably disable macros if they're causing us a problem, right? And so for the last one, over 90% of data breaches started with phishing emails. This one might be a, a, a little tougher, right? Because you don't really want to enable data breaches. And I'm pretty sure most of us aren't going to be able to disable email. Employee training. I've seen... Yes, absolutely. That's, that's absolutely one thing you do. Train people, educate them, right? It, surprisingly enough, we've had one client that tried to get rid of email. Didn't really work out for him really well. It took us about six months for them to be like, oh, this isn't working. So that training is part of practicing good email hygiene, right? It's, it's kind of a weird term, a weird thought process. You know, good email hygiene, it's almost the electronic equivalent of wash your hands. You know, it's the one of the simplest, most straightforward things that you can do. Quick side note, email hygiene, good email hygiene, and this is, it's a great segue here, right? Good email hygiene, it's a product of an awareness program, right? Getting people to do things like slow down for just a second, you know? The average person, I think I read a statistic that said that the average person spends about three seconds making a decision on an email about whether or not to click. That just isn't nearly enough time to figure out what to do with an email, right? And so when you're trying to figure out what a good email to hygiene looks like for your organization, you wanna take some of you, those key folks that we've been talking about, you want them to come together and figure out the answers to some of the questions, right? Some of the questions like, do you have regulated data inside of your email system? Do you have PHI? or PII or credit card information in there? What about client information, right? Credit card information. Heck, even links in the emails to files or folders with some of your sensitive business data, right? It is just a landmine, that's not the right word, it's a gold mine of, of information that malicious actors can use to their own benefit, right? So that list, it just goes on and on. But you wanna think about things like maybe adding an email banner to external emails that are coming in. Maybe put a data retention policy in place so that you're deleting things out of people's deleted items folder when they get rid of them. You know, We had one client where um, they had not turned that on and they had folks that were using their deleted items folder as a retention location. They had things that were like six years old in their deleted items folder. That's probably not good for anybody. They thought they deleted them. So email hygiene, is that kind of making sense to everybody? Mm -hmm. You know, we've, we've talked a bit about this, the cybersecurity culture. So what does that mean, right? E email hygiene, it's a, it's a really good segue into kind of this next topic. You know, how do you get security, how do you get a security first corporate culture? We all have corporate cultures. You know, we talked about the three core values that that help make up a Dafio's culture, right? And they're all kind of around integrity and and helping others. So that's that's really part of the Adafio culture. So each of our organizations have kind of this inherent culture that comes along with just being in business, right? So how do you get that culture to change and to adopt and to to kind of migrate into or move into a security first culture? Well. Some of the things that, that can and should be outcomes of that culture, right, of a successful cybersecurity culture are, are represented in this slide. I, it's, you know, I won't go through this one 
detailed line by, or, you know, block by block here, but, you know, anytime there's a financial implicate implication, you, you probably, you, you may want to get your, uh, the proper authorities involved. This is a point that we want to, we definitely want to call out very quickly here. And that is if you, if you suspect that you've been hit with some sort of wire fraud or uh, bank related compromise or attack, one of the first things that Adafio recommends is to engage with your local FBI office, right? The reason for that is the FBI has really close ties with the financial sector and industry. They have quite a bit of play and sway and they can actually get your money back if you get to them quickly enough. I know it's a, it's a little scary to say, ooh, call the FBI because you, I mean, you may not even want to publicize that you've been, a, you've been attacked, but we've seen, you know, $150,000, $250,000 be recovered before it got outside of the United States. So it's, it's extremely effective. Anyway, sorry for that, uh, um, that quick side tangent there. Oh, that's another, up. yeah, another, another piece of that FBI, um, curiosity is when paying ransoms, it's important to note that you may be federally liable if you pay a ransom to someone or a someone that is in or on the OFAC restricted list, right? So in other words, paying a ransom might break federal law. So getting the FBI engaged before you get to that part of the process and, and response is extremely important. You become so associated. Just, you become yeah. associated with a bad group, and therefore you're considered contingently liable, or maybe maybe directly, huh? Yes, sir. Absolutely. Not unless you'd want to get on what it means. <laughs> so, you know, some of the byproducts or some of the outcomes from, you know, this this culture is, or, or you know, this the cybersecurity culture first, it allows you to stay focused on your business instead of worrying about security, right? It helps you make wise investments, helps you make good decisions, and gives you greater access to a wider range of IT professionals because you're taught, you know, you're, you're, you're dealing with some really interesting technology. It allows you to more quickly and effectively comply with the regulations that are, you know, that you have to, if, if any of you have PCI, DSS, or HIPAA, or any of those sort of regulations inside your organizations, you know, having a cybersecurity culture that is security first, or at least, you know, talks about security pretty regularly can help your whole organization become more compliant. This is kind of a normal course of business. Is that making sense? And then we talk about this cultural evolution, right? So the evolution of, of culture inside of a, 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 an organization, if we talk about action versus reaction, you know, we, we talked a little bit about that earlier, being reactive is always more expensive, more intensive than being proactive, right? What we're trying to what we're trying to talk about in this slide is that on an organization's cybersecurity journey, it begins by making this mind shift from reacting to incidences to preparing for those incidences. Right? As you get that active engagement, you start doing interesting things like regularly meeting and discussing these topics of, of cybersecurity, and then eventually, as the organization continues to mature in their cyber practice you end up in this prepared and enabling piece, right? You're right, you, you begin to see, or you actually end up seeing this shift that cybersecurity stops being a cost center and starts being a business enabler. Cybersecurity, good, solid cybersecurity can be a differentiator in your business, in your organization, right? And then finally, I kind of wanted to talk for just a minute about security awareness culture, right? And uh, I, I'm sorry, I didn't, Nicole. One of the things that, you know, Nicole noticed earlier or mentioned earlier about, um, about education, there is no substitute. There's no substitute for educating and, uh, and awareness and just being top of mind, right? Your employees, 
I mean, they're, they're, they're the most important line of defense. We can put all the tech in place that you want to, but if there's not human thought process and discretion applied to the activities that people are taking, then there, there is no technology that's going to be smart enough or capable enough to prevent unintentional malicious activities, if that, if that kind of makes sense, right? So, yeah, we'll we'll find that in the two examples of the two CO farm members that got got compromised. And you'll find that in that in those examples. Yeah. So, what what Adafio advocates is using the security awareness program to safely test and train your folks in order to strengthen that human firewall. Right. I know that's it's kind of a little bit of a catchphrase there. Right. But it it really is that important. If people don't know, they can't act well. And then an, a, another little interesting statistic there that 94% of malware is received by email. So that just really highlights the point of how important the awareness and the email hygiene that we've been talking about is. Any questions about an awareness culture and, and you know, its importance and impact on an organization and how you might go about getting into one? Hey, Jeremy, yeah, just I got mm -hmm. a question. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt. Yeah. No, uh, please do. Yeah, McGibney. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the things, um, just kind of listening to your comments and, and watching that video and just thinking about, you know, companies that are that are growing or starting or startups, um, even larger companies, but this, this idea where you don't have to own the hardware, you don't have any on-premise gear, and you've got basically, you know, firewall protection in a PC. And, you know, I don't know if there's a lot of companies that are 100% in the cloud now, um, meaning that everything is a subscription service. There's just no, we don't have any licensing necessarily. We've, we've got access. Uh, um, maybe two to three devices each. And so what do you, what do you recommend if we don't have the hardware? Is it, it are we focused at the firewall level, uh, at, at the program for pro programs at the firewall level, as well as programs at the workstation mobile device level? Is that how you think about it? That's a very interesting question. In cloud environments, I, I think my response to you is you don't need infrastructure. You don't, it's, it's kind of this concept of, are you infrastructure centric or are you data centric, right? And you, you're, I have a feeling you may be reading ahead inside of our slides a little bit. We'll talk about this uh, in, in a little bit of a depth here in just a minute. None of what we are talking about requires either hardware on site or cloud services. Everything we are talking about can and does apply to both environments. So as far as implementation itself goes, you're absolutely correct. There are some things that you can do at the firewall. There are some things that you can do inside of those cloud services themselves. And there's a lot of stuff that you can do on the endpoints themselves. So the enforcement and implication or implementation is really kind of agnostic of whether or not you're subscription based or license based. Right? Yeah. So okay. yeah. yeah, yeah, a lot of what we're talking about here is is more approach and how and what do we as leaders need to think about and how do we approach as opposed to how do we implement? If that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Great question, awesome. Mike. Yeah, great question. Thank you, Mike. So finally, we're gonna we're kind of gonna get into some of the practical activities, right? You as a leader might be able to to you might need to care about. There's definitely a storm, and it's not really even on the horizon, right? Kind of this picture that I want to paint for us for with, with this slide is that there is. You know, there's this storm of malicious actors and attacks that are constantly going on in the internet. You may and probably are being targeted now. You're at least being probed around the edges, right? Cool. Folks are trying to trying to find holes inside of your armor. If you're not currently dealing with the breach, then you're one of the 
one of the many of us that are kind of sitting in that in that eye of the storm and we're just trying to move as quickly as we can and prepare ourselves to be outrun by the storm right then it, it, it's kind of a kind of an odd analogy that i'm making there but if you if you guys have ever seen the movie twister it's one of my favorite movies of all time there's this there's this great scene where you know at the at the end of the movie this this huge tornado is swirling around kind of the main characters and they're just trying to stay out of harm's way right so i'm stretching a little bit there anyway so i like for us to kind of go over a few of those practical items that might make you know a substantial difference to your existing security posture the first one super important right you got to own your security you got to i mean you cannot um, there are some regulations that won't allow you to offload liability, right? So you've got to, you've got to take ownership of it. You've got to care about it. You've got to find a qualified champion, right? Find them, empower them. You got to care about your culture. Uh, a steering committee is an, a very interesting concept as well. Get a group of folks together to talk about, make decisions about things. You know, even in a small business, it's important that cyber is a collaborative effort. Right, the owner, the accountant, the accountants, managers, everybody, all work on defining security risk in your business together. Right. So this, this kind of this idea of success comes from everyone being on the same page when it comes to cybersecurity. And then a couple of the things here I want to I want to make uh, uh, sure that we we talk about for just a second. That's establish a path, not a plan. Right. And what we mean by that is if you have a way of approaching things, a way of of if you are on a cybersecurity journey, if you're on this path, you don't have to worry about the plan going awry. You know how to respond. You're resilient to the forces that are at play against your organization, as opposed to this is what I'm going to do and how do I get this done? This is what I'm going to do in, tw you know, in, in 2020. And if something knocks you off of that plan, you don't have a good remediation strategy for it. And then the last piece here is this collaborate, collaborate, collaborate. I cannot stress this enough, right? The more people that you can get to care and be engaged inside of your organization, the better off you're going to be. So real quick, we're going to talk about social engineering red flags. This is, it, it's, a, it's a fun slide to go through. It's a bit of an eye chart, but it's, it's fun to kind of go through to think about this so when we're talking about good email hygiene and we're talking about security awareness training and stuff, these are only some of the elements that are necessary to think about on every email that you process, right? Who's this thing from? Did I expect this email to come in? Who was it sent to? Is it sent to me actually, or was it sent to a group of individuals? You know, those hyperlinks that are sitting in there, you know, there are, there are things you can do like hover over the hyperlink and see where it really goes and up. You know, looking for malicious hyperlinks. Did I, you know, the date that the email was sent? What's in the subject line? You know, the the foreign actors, the malicious actors, are getting real good at emulating English. So no longer can we we kind of rely on broken English being a good indicator. You know, does the email have attachments? Were you expecting attachment? That invoice, that PDF invoice. Did I really buy something from that company? And so should I open it? And the content of the, uh, the content of the email, you know, are you trying to sell me something? Are you trying to create a sense of urgency? All of these are security awareness pieces that you've got to be thinking about on each email that you're interacting with. So it really is a lot to ask about of our folks. And then I have one more item before um, before we get into um, this. Uh, some of the uh, some of the entrance stuff that I, I'm going to ask Keith to to go over with us, and this is this idea of zero a zero trust model, right? Arguably, it's a byproduct of this borderless networking that I'm sure we've all heard about. We've talked a little bit about cloud uh, cloud services and and subscription based licensing. So one of the byproducts of that is this idea of a zero trust model, right? As a business kind of shifts away from that castle and moat thinking into you know, this electronic world that has no borders, this cloud-based infrastructure that we're dealing with, we are, we're really moving from infrastructure-based thinking that gives way to this borderless networking and a data-centric thinking. That's, that's 
that's an important idea there. No longer are we thinking infrastructure, now we're thinking data, right? And you begin, you begin this path by putting intelligence into the data itself, into the files themselves, right? You pair that with the enforcement protocols that were, I mean, they were originally developed, the old rights management system, you know, and then on top of all that, you finally, you, you layer that, this, this idea of this convergence of identity providers and multi-master key management and trust management systems, all that results in this idea of zero trust. So, sorry, I kind of waxed geek on you there for just a second. Um, there's a lot of little nuances in this idea of zero trust. So let me try to explain this maybe a, a little bit of a different way that hopefully will make a bit more sense, right? You're on your tablet, which is a device, opening a board packet, which is the data, connected to your personal hotspot, which is the network, at nine o'clock in the morning, which is the workload, using Microsoft Teams, which is the people aspect, right? So if all of those things are true and you got the rules in place that say, okay, if all of those things are true, let me open that file. You can actually open your board packet. The idea of zero trust is if it's two o'clock in the morning, maybe that's not me, right? So two o'clock in the morning, I can't open a board packet. Or if I'm trying to open it from my phone instead of my tablet, maybe we've collectively decided that you shouldn't open board packets on your phone. So if any of these individual elements here doesn't pass muster, the idea of zero trust says you are not who you said you were opening what you said it was okay to open at a time that it was okay to open it, right? So that's the idea of, of zero trust. Not only are you identifying me, you're identifying all of the things about me, where I am. Am I in Arkansas versus sitting over in Germany, right? Or Russia or, or wherever. So those are all of that together is a convergence of zero. To, I don't trust anything until I trust everything. Make sense? It does. And now if... Uh, I'll ask Keith to if he'll, uh, if he'll take us through the uh, the insurance piece of this. Sure, thanks, Jeremy. That was great, and uh, uh, I learned something each time I hear you talk. So I appreciate uh, what you've shared there. So um, I want to talk a little bit about cyber insurance. You know, we all have insurance for different things, and the reason we have risk uh, insurance is because we're trying to mitigate a risk or reduce the impact of an, uh, an event that might happen. So there's, there's kind of two things that, um, well, and so in, in recent years, in the last 10 years, cyber, secure, uh, cyber insurance has become very um, important and uh, insurance companies offer it and uh, I highly recommend it for everyone. You know, when you think about risk, you think about two things. You think about probability of the event. How likely is it going to happen? Well, what Jeremy has shared with you is ideas on how to reduce that probability by doing certain things and practices and t training your people. But guess what? The, the likelihood of an event is still there. And um, what you can do is try to reduce it, but it doesn't go away. And in today's world, the hackers are get becoming more proficient and better and uh you know i think we all read about uh you know the, the u.s treasury being hacked just here recently so um the second aspect of it is the impact to your business so if an event happens how did how, how does it impact you and there's kind of two components of that to be thinking about to try to determine how much insurance you want to have one is um, your data. What happens if your data is compromised or put out in the public domain or someone gets information on your uh, from your system? And, and that, that's one thing. The other is impact to your business if you're down. This, if, if someone goes in and locks up all your computers because until you pay a ransom, what's the impact to your business 
of this down period of time. So probability and impact are things that each business owner should consider and try to understand um, and then to go into the marketplace and consider uh, and buy insurance for cyber. Uh, next slide, Tim or Jeremy. So here's um, an example of some of the types of things that cyber policies cover. They cover you know, some of the forensic costs to figure out what's going on, the crisis management cost, um, notification, some if you're in healthcare and uh, per, uh, personal um, health, patient health information is compromised, sometimes you have to notify each of those patients. So there are certain industries where data has very strict regulations about what you have to do. And the cost associated with that uh, is all adds up. So here's an example of a 6,000 record breach containing personal identifiable information or PII and um, patient health information. And you can see that for even a relatively small amount of data, um, some of the cost associated with that is, um, is, is pretty high. Um, so, um, I, I, why don't you go on to the next slide? Uh, so, um, what, I, what I would recommend is that you, sh you know, um, if you don't have it, certainly get it. If you have it, reshop it each year. We do this. I, we've been, um, you know, 10 years ago, you, cyber insurance didn't exist. Um, we started doing cyber insurance for our company, gosh, I guess five or six years ago. And there's, um, for, I think there's two companies that at least that I'm aware of that are pretty big players in this space. It doesn't mean they're the only players and you shouldn't, you should look at others. But uh, we chose Travelers for our company, primarily for one reason, they had a breadth of um, coverage about uh, our work product and what was included in uh, to do, that would be covered by the policy. So for us and our what we do, that was real important. Another company that is pretty widely known and, or does a, um, a good job with cybersecurity is Beasley Insurance. And those are just two that I'm familiar with. There are a lot more. I'm not saying those are the best. I'm not saying they're the only ones. It's just two that I'm familiar with. And um, so if you're, uh, I'd encourage you to dig into this space and, and get to, um, and, and get a policy if you don't have one. And if you have any questions about what we're doing and why we're doing what we're doing on insurance, I'll be glad to visit with you because I, I'm the one who made those decisions for our company back, um, you know, five years ago when we started this. And, and I know that we've got some, um, I think the last slide I have is just an overview of a little bit of who we are. Um, I don't wanna spend uh, a lot of time about Adafio. Um, it's more important the topic, but here's, here's a list of di different recognition and kind of the things we do. I'd go back to that first slide we showed about core values. That's really what we are at our heart if you pull us back. Um, next slide. Uh, let's go on down two more slides. There we go. Um, and here's um, a high-level summary of some of the cybersecurity services that we do. This whole idea of being proactive and trying to assess risk, identifying where there's gaps or holes, perhaps in security, helping lay out a roadmap of how to get to a reduced risk environment, and then uh, some consulting services uh, that we do for uh, security uh, on an ongoing basis. Any questions about any of that or any things that I've shared? He's, he's I, you built a heck of a little company. Yeah, questions. Question? question? Someone yeah. have a question? 
I thought I heard someone. Question. Um, Question? Tim. Yeah. Tim, Bruce Dunn. There you go, Bruce. All right. You're on now. Yeah. Um, I'm sure no one else has this problem, but uh, Jeremy, what what about personal passwords? <laughs> and and the just, oh my gosh, it just drives me insane. Oh, that's a that's a great topic that we can spend a whole I don't know, uh, yeah a, a whole three beers on right. Yes. Um, so I, I'd say a couple of things uh, about personal passwords. The first is don't mix personal and business, right? Do not use your personal accounts. I'm sorry. Do not don't use your business addresses for your personal accounts. That's just kind of you know baseline. And then what I would say is at a personal level do some investigating and some looking and find a password management database solution or application that works well for you, mm -hmm. right? That way you need to remember one password and you can, you can even tie it in your face, your, your, your thumb, or, you know, however you want to get into it. Um, but put all of your stuff in there and a couple of key items here. And if you guys want to want to take note of this, this is, I think this is probably the most important piece whatever application you need you 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 land on that you like that you want to use right needs to be purpose built please don't use an encrypted note on your phone right because once the phone is cracked your note is cracked too but the the thing that i think is really important is that whatever application you land on needs to be able to be backed up and recovered with your phone and even more importantly needs a tie-in to have I been pwned or some sort of service that checks the dark web for you or looks at the strength of your password, right? So you wanna look at some of the more rich features as opposed to some of the more simplistic ones. Yes, you wanna spend a little bit of money on this, right? I spend 599 annually on my own personal password management system. Now, personal passwords, as far as your organization goes, that's a much broader much deeper conversation to have, right? But as far as personal goes, something that can sync between your phones, something that gets backed up, you know, um, something that's got some additional services in it. But absolutely don't just write them down. Yeah. And Jeremy, I'm going to ask you the million dollar question or if you, sure. would you mind sharing a couple of the platforms you like? Because I just, my head explodes every time I start down this path of research. So. Absolutely. Well, let me ask you, let me answer your question with a question. Okay. What uh, what ecosystem are you in? Are you an Android or Apple? Apple. And okay. then Microsoft Office, if that makes gotcha. sense. Um, so I would say in, the, in, the, in that ecosystem, my personal favorite is a solution called InPass, E-N-P-A-S-S. -S. Okay. Right. The reason I like that one is I'm... I'm a bit of an old school guy. I don't want that stuff sitting in the cloud somewhere. And then I turn around and sync it using iCloud. So <laughs> kind of defeating the whole purpose, right? Um, but there are, there's LastPass, there's one password, right? I'd say if, if I, if you wanted to put me on the spot, I would recommend either InPass or LastPass. Now LastPass is a cloud only and it's got tie-ins and it's super well known, but they just, they do a really good job and they seem to end up in our top five every time we do an analysis. Okay. Hey, thank you for sharing that specific information. That at least gets me started. <laughs> and I'm sure no one else has this problem on this call. No, it's a great value. And can I, can I uh, do something here? You know, we say in Northwest Arkansas that or I believe that a, a lot of what our progress has, has to do with collaboration and having a collaborative culture. It really starts with Northwest Arkansas Council. And uh, can I mention Clinton Bell, uh, a great uh, quadrivian. He's on, on the call. Ask Clinton if he wanted to add anything to this. Is that okay, Keith? I know you all know each other. and They're a class act, quadrivian, and they're used by... A lot of clients, I know y'all compete, but we can all make the pie bigger. Everybody gets bigger, better. And uh, Absolutely. Clinton. Love to hear from Clint. Clinton, do you want to add any of that, buddy? You know, I appreciate you asking, um, but I don't have a whole lot to add. I think Jeremy did a great job. Um, the cyber insurance is something that's very important to pay attention to. And, and I think that Jeremy's talk about the culture, which he revisited a few times, is is exactly on point. 
Um, there's a lot of training that can be done, a lot of questions that can be answered with technology, uh, but in the end, uh, it's about making correct decisions. And, uh, you know, I, I did sit in through most of it. I apologize. I took a phone call and didn't catch all of it. But, uh, you know, just a few statistics to add to what they're doing. October was Cybersecurity Month, and we attended a whole lot of cybersecurity things. I'm sure they did as well. But one or two of the neat facts, um, things that we learned during that time was uh, from the beginning of COVID, of March until October, an example, since you brought up ransomware, is in March, it was one thing. In October, it was 350% increased. In March, it was the number one risk we had to worry about. But in October, it was number three because there was two more bad actors who had overtaken that 350% increase. So we live in a world right now where we're 100% under attack all the time. Another factor in 2019, the ransomware average ransom was in the eleven to twelve thousand dollar per ransomware range. In 2020, it exceeded hundred thousand dollars the average. So the increase in cost and potential cost that was being talked about a while ago is absolutely something you have to pay attention to. Whether it's your cost of what you're going to have to fork out, the cost of what you're going to have to with your downtime, and or you know the cost of dealing with the government because you're absolutely correct with every statement you guys made. Good job. Right. And didn't you, didn't you used to say that if you, if you got attacked, um, a significant attack, sometimes it's a, some companies fail pretty quite often when they get a pretty serious attack. I don't know what the stats are, but you used to throw that out. I think I was, I recall. So yeah, the, I think the 2019 Verizon breach report says that 60% of all small businesses that experience a significant cyber attack, close their doors within six months. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for letting us do that, Keith. And uh, it says a lot about both of you. Uh, Clinton, thank you. Clinton's got a great, great business and someday you all ought to join together. Okay. There's a pick <laughs> for you. You did good as a team. Um, all right. Can we move on? Are we okay? You want to wrap it up? Keith, wrap it up? No, okay. nothing to add. Let's press on. Um, I'd love to hear the real life stories from some folks. So let's, um, let's, let's yeah, jump into that. Okay. And then Keith, um, I just want to say you are such a class act. I'm, I was Keith, a member of CO Forum once, makes a real difference in that forum. And and he's you can there's his footprints, his fingerprints are all over this. You can tell he's very culture oriented, and, and culture is a, a big big part of anybody's success. Should they have good success? And I see that Michael Clark's on, and uh, Michael is one of the people that have been kind enough to. He survived his uh, breach, and uh, Michael, you, as you may recall, helped build Mitchell communications into the great company it is and now runs four mediums in, in our CO form four. Michael, would you like to share with us a little about your experience? And then uh, I'll share what Tim, the other gentleman who's a Quadrivium client today uh, due to that breach and it's very happy with Quadrivium. And, um, and then we'll go to Bo with uh, some insurance and Nicole to drill down on some, both of the, uh, one of our insurance members and, and uh, we'll uh, ask him for some more advice on insurance before we wrap up. We'll be here about another 10 or 15 minutes. So Michael Clark, do you have the stage if you will? Not that it's a stage, but Michael, you there? Yeah, can you hear me okay? Yeah, we got you. There so you hi everybody, thank, thank you. Rare, rarely do I come onto a call and, and share my uh, experience of being attacked. <laughs> yeah, really. And so I, sadly and, and fortunately, we were able to really navigate our way through it. And it was, a, it was about a three month saga, just so you know, the investment of time and energy and effort went into it. In September of 2019, we were a target of what I learned on that day in mid-September as spear phishing. If you ever heard of that term, or maybe you've talked about it, but it's a pretty sophisticated hack. Somebody had gotten into our managing director's Office 365 account, reprofiled themselves within her account, and changed all of the internal emails to forward to junk files immediately into a junk file. So there was a pathway that was completely built prior to them getting into the hack. Then they sent a PDF that was auto-populated, which we found out afterwards with a hacking code, like an AI code that anytime you forwarded it, filled in a brand new invoice with a brand new data and set. And we only figured that out afterwards when our accountant, our accounting team tried to forward it to the bank and it changed the data. And it was one of the things that triggered my, uh, my alerts, but I'll, I'll get into the, try not to get in too deep into the details, but 
effectively what had happened after the person had sort of hacked into our managing director's email, she sent this really, you know, I, I would call it tonal friendly uh, on brand email from our managing director. So, hey girl, you know, this kind of really casual, cool language that happens, they kind of picked through her emails and sort of saw how they talked to each other. It was like, hey girl, I got this invoice. I want you to, to process it right away. We've really got to get this thing going because it's an urgent buy. $29,000 invoice to a company that had a wire transfer through Wells Fargo. We, she, I was out of the office. They knew I was out of the office. I will probably never put an out of office me email on ever again for that very reason. And, and sort of the, the, the hack unfolded or the phishing attack unfolded. She started the transaction and didn't confirm it, didn't go to text, didn't come out of it, was just replying to that email. So she got caught in that death loop of all of her email going to junk, which was giving them enough time to act as our managing director to set the process in play. It probably took a total of about two hours. And if you are aware of this, and if you're not, it turns out that a, a wire is much like a rail car when it heads down the track. You can't get in front of it. You send your delay. We've uncovered the fact that it was fraud when I saw it and I was driving back from the woods and I said, hey, you got to stop this thing immediately. So they ran to the bank, tried to get it stopped, but the train set off behind the other train, if you will, to stop it. And the only way to catch that wire transfer and process is to meet them at the bank and try and catch them at the bank before they get it. These folks are pretty sophisticated that when they go into an account, they wire it back out to a foreign account or offshore account, and it disappears at that point. So we had literally nanoseconds to try and stop it. The problem is when you deal with wells and you try and stop a wire and it's part of scam, they require you to fill out an affidavit, an affidavit that says that they are not guilty of any loss. So this 29,000 left our bank went through the wire, we're chasing it with a, a decline or a, or, a, or a cancellation, if you will. And when it got there, we were told that we didn't have, they, that Wells couldn't give us an answer on whether or not they could stop it or not until we filled out the affidavit. So we had to go through our legal team to try and get this legal language to where we weren't giving away the full 29,000. We had to wait. This is where the waiting game came into play. And so in the meantime, we were encouraged to buy because I filed a report with our insurance company and no, no, I will just tell you, we carry the Hartford. And um, my agent said the very first time that she's ever seen us, we checked this cybersecurity checkbox that was specifically about architectured. Um, it was like, I, I don't remember the name, but if you guys can, can, can enlighten the, the audience here or the group, but it was something that was specifically about social engineered cyber attack. It was like a clause in a checkbox. And for some odd reason, I checked this box. So we had coverage and the agent said, this is the first time I've ever seen this. I've never, I've never come across it, but you are a lucky winner today. You've checked this box. And so in theory, we were covered up to our deductible amount, which for you all, it was like six or $700 or something like that. So we knew at one point that having gone through this, that we would only have a mass, uh, a, a loss of 600, but that didn't stop us from going after the 29 K that was in process and gone from our account at the time. So I'll have, you know, we had to report it to the Bentonville police department, which is where our headquarters is. We had to go to our agent, and they had to send out a fraud alert guy from Texas who came in and did a full assessment on us during that period of time, all while still waiting. We ended up getting just a wire transfer back into our account for everything less. It was, it turned out to be like 27 and some change. No, I take that back. It was like 25. So there was like four or $5,000 missing. And so we were able to file that claim and we were still out that certain amount, but got a claim check and the returned amount back from Harvard. So is that, okay, six minutes. Tim, that well was done. three months uh, boiled down and synthesized. Questions? That's well done. You are a pro, I'll tell you. And you're, the, you're one of the best too, Michael. Uh, you, we've so enjoyed you being in our forums and all you bring 
your your mind. Um, any questions for Michael? You weren't choking on your toothpaste, but you're probably a little, little worried about where else you're going to get attacked, weren't you? <laughs> What's that? I said you weren't choking on your toothpaste in the morning, but you're probably worried about what else could happen, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, we, we, we seem to have gotten a lot. I mean, you guys are probably all seeing those regular emails. We ended up, uh, we ended up adding Barracuda network to all of our emails. We've upgraded ESET and all of our virus software, but we're a small, we're a small company. I mean, to hire somebody that's a, an aggressive loss prevention, cyber attack. I mean, we were getting quotes for 60 to $70,000 to protect our company. And it's just like, man, at what point do you, say yes to that. And that was our difficult decision. And so we're trying to do our part. We, we feel like we've got some things in check, but yeah, you just got to insure from one side and, and assure from the other side, you know, with your, uh, you know, with your assets and how you're playing it out. And honestly, adding Barracuda, Barracuda type network protection caused us a bit of disruption in our operation because you know, we were filtering out our own clients. And so our sales team and our folks were really frustrated by this. So you have to go in what they call whitelist and bring these, these companies back into play. And so it was about two months worth of disruption there as well. So, yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, yeah. listen, I, it, it was a uh, very difficult experience for both our managing director and our accounting team. They all thought they were potentially could lose their jobs over this and, and um, yeah, it was a it was a tough scenario how, as it played out, but we were able to mitigate it calmly. We were able to be patient. And we were able to recover nearly all of what we lost, except for the uh, premium. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for your thanks for being willing to come on and do that, Michael. It means a lot. Hey Tim, I, I've got a comment to add. You know, this misdirection of funds is a major thing that's happening. It's maybe not quite as prevalent as ransomware, but at times it feels like we see more of the misdirection of funds than even the ransomware thing. And one of the other things, it's not a technology solution, but a process uh, that helps mitigate that risk is making sure that there's a rigorous process for when like a customer is to be making payments to you and somehow those funds from that customer of yours gets redirected someone else to someone else because they thought you sent them a notice about you've opened a new bank account, you know, and you want your funds to go to a different place. But the way you can mitigate that is having a rigorous process that says, okay, you're, you're only going to change sending your money to us if you use our form. And if you call us on the phone and make sure that it's, you know, we, that it's, truly us that is asking you to uh, redirect funds to a different bank. So yeah, yeah. Uh, there's just some old fashioned kinds of ways from a process and paper and picking up the phone and talking to people before they send large amounts of money. Uh, there was a Northwest Arkansas client that lost a seven figure, well, they didn't lose it. They had at risk a seven figure amount of money. This was in the press, so, so it, it's public info. Mm -hmm. And, um, so, I mean, the amount of money that can get redirected, as Michael said, when it's wired, and it happens quickly. <laughs> so, um, anyway, just a comment about paper processes and picking up the phone to make sure something's yeah. as it's supposed to be when it has high risk. And have that culture that you talk about, right, in, of all this uh, across the umbrella of, of how we think, right? So, let me just share with you in very brief, uh, the gentleman that's a also a member of one of our forums. I won't bring up his name, but he uh, has a firm that uh, uh, is now served happily by Quadrivium. He wanted everybody to know that. He, they really helped him a lot to get to where he was. He was with a different service provider. And I guess uh, one of his uh, team members went on to consulting architect for the Northwest Arkansas Children's Hospital for some research. The tests on the website did not load correctly. And he received a pop-up notification that said Google Chrome needed to update fonts. The font update requested looked look legitimate, so he and appeared to be from Google Chrome. So he tried to install it. It wouldn't install. And then he kind of went on and went about the rest of his day. Shortly after, all of a sudden, there, no one could open their PDF files and they got everything got locked up. And then they realized that their service provider hadn't been backing them up for like three months. And they, um, they thought they were backed up to have their own servers on, and, 
in, in their in their office, but they just a, a a really unfortunate thing there. They were asked for some, to pay some ransom. They had to talk to the FBI. Had to fork over a thousand dollars. I guess the price has gone up quite a bit there. But a lot of trouble trying to get it into Bitcoin. Had to be Bitcoin, and uh, and then and he lost. They lost so much time. I mean, he thinks it cost him a month of revenues. You know, just trying to. It was three weeks. You know, held, had everything held held up all the data and he had to trust that, you know, after paying the, what's the, what's the percentage on the, when you pay the ransom that you're going to get to open them back up. Has that been, is there any percentage there? Uh, do you have to pay more sometimes and any, any intelligence there, Keith or, or uh, Clinton or uh, Jeremy? I don't know that we, I don't know that we have any good hard stats to go after that. Yeah. The, historically it's been, uh, it's a bad business model to not render services for payments given, right? So uh, ransomware has kind of become commoditized in, in a sense. So um, I, the stories are, I mean, you're pretty much going to get your data back at least the first time. I see. Well, it's the only good news we've heard today, maybe on this topic, you know, it's a tough topic, but uh, thank you for that. Um, okay. Any questions on that? So with our, let's go to the last and not least whatsoever, our good friend, Bo Biddle, who's got a great insurance agency. By the way, Michael Tarkin's PR agency, Public Relations, along with Ed's sister, built a great company up in Benville that anybody who's looking for public relations, I'd encourage them. Ed Nicholson had, had uh, encouraged us to do some business with Michael, and we've loved it. So we highly recommend him, and we also recommend this next gentleman, my insurance agent, and uh, Bo Biddle, and he has... And Nicole with him. So I'll let you both, if you could take about five minutes here, we'll be five minutes over a little, then cover some insurance. And uh, again, I encourage everybody to consider Bo. has got a great agency here. A name known for insurance, I'd say, when you around here. Bo? Yeah, thanks, Tim. Uh, I've got a couple of real brief comments, and then uh, I'm going to let uh, Nicole with Evolve uh, jump in as the expert and she's got some, uh, some short slides to, to review with you, but, you know, uh, to, from the insurance perspective regarding cyber insurance, um, you, the way it, the way it's, um, it's progressed over the years is everybody's got their general liability, um, and or business owners, uh, package, um, uh, policy uh, that protects their their property, if any, and in their general liability operations. And as uh, as as cyber risk became uh, more and more prevalent, um, the first thing that happened is those uh, standard uh, commercial pol business owner policy packages started adding riders with sublimits that would protect you from um, uh, from from that kind of risk and. Um, while still sufficient, depending on what your risk size is, um, in some cases, more and more we're finding, and you'll see this in, in Nicole's slides, that um, that it's it's outgrown the the risk uh, the the the, the sublimit uh, endorsement that um, is on your on your regular policy. So the what the next thing that happened is some of the companies started writing uh, standalone. Uh, professional type cyber policies, uh, like what Keith mentioned with travelers, uh, they, they are one that writes that kind of policy. Uh, Philadelphia is another one that writes that kind of policy. Be I'm sure Beasley clearly is one that, that uh, I'm not familiar with them, but that writes that um, kind of, of, of policy. Um, and, and so uh, what two years ago, um, we were approached uh, by by Nicole, uh, my partner and I, and um, and we had a meeting with her where uh, she she told us uh, about her company Evolve, and Evolve uh, is put a lot of research and time into studying the cyber insurance and cyber risk um, space, and it's their sole focus. Uh, it's their it, their um, it's their it, it is the, the cyber policy is their um, is their product um, and and uh, with that the more that we saw that and looked at that we, we were blown away by the comprehensive uh, uh, nature uh, and coverages that they added in their in their product and so 
um, you know, since that time, every business that, uh, that we, every client that we have and uh, our agency itself, we, we've offered this, uh, this policy to them um, at their renewals, um, um, you know, uh, for the ones that had the sublimits, for the ones that n- needed to consider cyber. And so it's just, it's standard policy. All of our producers are required to do it. We, we, we look at it at, 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 every, at every renewal and, um, and it's, uh, we, we wrote our own cyber insurance policy with Evolve as well. Um, there is, I've not found a, a comparable um, product in the marketplace that is as comprehensive and, as, um, and has such a uh, in-touch um, uh, um, uh, product to, to the needs in that space. And so um, with that, I would, uh, I'd love to uh, let, let Nicole jump in and, and uh, so Nicole, Nicole's firm has evolved quicker than the others around this, huh? <laughs> Pun intended. Nicole? Yeah. And, uh, how about that endorsement, Nicole? That's pretty good. Take it away. Good. Thank you guys. And I'll share my screen here. Um, hopefully we don't have any issues with that. Um, so my name is Nicole. I am with Evolve. As Bo said, all we do is cyber insurance. We actually created uh, solely to Uh, give cyber insurance policies to our clients and um, a little bit about myself too and I'll go quickly through the slides so we won't take too long. Um, I'm based out of Austin, Texas. Actually, Michael, uh, the incident response team that most likely worked on your claim with the Hartford was probably our forensics expert, Solar Security, down here in Austin. Um, But I actually went to the U of A, so I'm a former Razorback. Um, My little brother played there too, so I have um, big ties to Northwest Arkansas. But (laughs) I wanted to just briefly go through with you guys in a little bit more depth what these cyber policies can cover, because as you've all seen today, um, these claims are a mess and it can leave a business on a hook for a lot of funds. Um, We've really harped on the human error aspect of these claims. Really all it takes is someone clicking on a link that they shouldn't have or sending payment to someone that they shouldn't have. And it ends up costing the business thousands, if not millions of dollars. And the FBI actually compiles each year all losses due to hackers and splits it out by state. It's called um, the IC3 report or the internet crime report. And the state of Arkansas, as you guys can see throughout the years has really increased in terms of losses. But what I always think is interesting looking at these numbers is Um, Between 2018 and 2019, I mean, the loss numbers just skyrocketed, but the number of victims didn't really as much. So what this is telling us is, you know, the claims, they're getting steadily more frequent, but they're getting a lot more severe. So each time this attack happens, it's costing the business more and more money. Um, This is also a very understated number as well, because it only counts those that were actually reported to the FBI, which is suggested, of course, but not everyone is going to follow that. Um, And this is also just true dollars out the doors to hackers. So those fraudulent transfers or those extortion payments, this doesn't count all of the losses that a business might experience, that lost income, paying for legal advice, forensics experts, that they still have to incur um, when these attacks happen. So what really can cyber insurance cover? Um, It's there to protect your intangible assets. And as Bo said, this really started about 20 years ago around the dot-com boom, right around 2000 is when the first cyber insurance policies came out. They were very much liability focused. And I feel like that's what a lot of people think of when they think cyber insurance. Well, oh, I lost someone's information and now they're gonna bring that lawsuit against you. Well, if you look at our actual claims payout and from the discussion that we've all had today, Um, It really is emphasizing the importance of first party coverages and costs associated with that because more likely than not, that's what's going to be affecting your business. Not to say that, you know, the liability side isn't important, but it's not a given that someone's going to bring that lawsuit against you. What is a given is having to bring in a forensics team, figure out what happened, reimbursing for a fraudulent transfer, any lost income that the business might experience. And First party coverages, this is really where Evolve shines. This is where we were built to be the broadest. Um, And so we can pick up some costs here that many didn't even realize could be picked up on a cyber policy, such as reputational harm. You know, because of the cyber event, did you lose some customers? That's something that could be reimbursed on a cyber policy on top of, you know, that business interruption, lost income from not being able to access your systems. 
So we've talked about this today. The top two exposures for all businesses are really their email addresses and their bank accounts, because that's how the top two attacks occur, um, which are ransomware and fraudulent transfers. Someone had mentioned that this earlier that um, fraudulent transfers are starting to see that type of attack, the social engineering more and more. Um, it still is our number two most frequently occurring attack, but it's definitely um, people feel the most pain when this attack happens because standardly it's not recoverable. There's about a 24 to 48 hour window where the bank can reverse these charges, but um, usually it's not found that it was a fraudulent request until that true vendor or client is following up. Um, something to note on these fraudulent transfers where many people don't think of, you know, multiple bank accounts that should be covered, but the insured's bank account, your bank account, the business bank account should always be picked up on a cyber form. You should also try and have the C-suite executives bank account be picked up as well, because a lot of times those C-suites are very exposed for those spear phishing attempts. So um, those C-suite executives are usually highly marketed on the company website. There's a lot of information about them, how they started the company, what they do in their free time. Um, so hackers are able to really target an attack and an email towards them with information that is a lot more relevant than just kind of a, a random scatter blast. Um, and a lot of people nowadays do their personal banking on their work computer. So um, hackers know there's probably a lot more money sitting in those C-suite bank accounts and they'll go after those. Um, and then lastly, the third bank account is your client's bank account. So hackers can very easily pose as your business, try and solicit payment from your clients. And so you want to make sure, especially because there are so many cyber carriers in the market right now, that all three of those are going to be picked up because they can still have a negative implication on your business. So we kind of already touched on some of these cyber hygiene steps and I'll finish it up here, but um, just little things that you guys can do to better protect yourselves. Um, checking if you've been breached, which I'll show you a neat tool on the next slide. Um, some of the internal measures, turning on MFA, using a password manager, phishing awareness trainings for your employees, and making sure that you have great backups. Now, a lot of these are actually included in some comprehensive cyber policies and cyber forms, but the one that I wanted to show you guys today, and I think would be really cool for anyone that's on this call, um, is to get a dark web scan. So um, Jeremy had mentioned the website, Have I Been Pwned? You can go and individually check your emails to see if you've been a part of any breaches. But if you shoot um, your website over to Bo, we can actually run a dark web scan on your company. So we have an API integration to where we can see if any corporate information is sitting out on the dark web. Um, this doesn't mean that your business has been hacked into. It just means that employees have used their information on some third party website that had a breach. So like LinkedIn, Evite, Marriott, MGM Grand, they've all had breaches. If your company information is sitting out there, then those employees are receiving a lot more of those fake fraudulent emails. And we want to make sure that they are not clicking on any of that data. So what's actually included within our program, we can get you that dark web scan. It's completely free. Um, you'll get the broad cyber policy as well and really lean on your insurance agent to make sure that they're digging through the policy language because with all of the different carriers in this space right now, everyone has different stipulations within their form. It's not standardized across the market. And uh, Michael, luckily for you guys, you didn't have a risk management condition within your policy, which is something that we see sometimes where um, the carrier will actually require that you call and try and verify that transfer prior to sending out the funds. If you don't do that, then your claim is denied. So you just want to make sure that your insurance agent is really looking through the form to see, you know, what's actually included in the policy. Um, but some of the risk management services that are completely free with Evolve, um, two of them are employee training tools. So you can send out fake phishing emails to your employees and see who the clickers are. Hopefully it's not you. <laughs> um, send them to a training afterwards. We also send out video training each month that um, focuses on a new cyber topic. We include a vulnerability scan so we can do a scan of your network, see if there are any um, basically measures which can be improved upon a dark web scanning tool. So it'll continuously monitor the dark web for your information. And then lastly, control case, if you are um, handling any sort of sensitive data that has regulatory requirements surrounding it, 
you can get a free 30 minute consultation with the legal team to make sure that you are in compliance. So I know we went a little bit over, so sorry about that guys. Um, but key takeaway, I think for everyone here is every single business has an exposure, really comes down to the human error. Um, and it's having those great controls on the front end while also having a good cyber policy sitting behind you on the back end that will make these attacks a really quick and easy fix and not something longstanding and detrimental that you know could have negative implications on the business long-term, so. Hey, that was great, thank you, Nicole. Revolve, a value-added provider of the category, it feels like. We talk about driving the value proposition, one of our pillars, and that's a good example of how you keep driving that value beyond just insuring someone, right, Bo? That's exactly right. Uh, good. So, Bo, you know, what I like about Bo, being a former CEO with a local bank and then going on to Stevens, Inc., being a bond financing guy with the big bonds and the big guys in, at Stevens, uh, he's intellectually cu curious and independent agency goes out and finds some really great and continues to add, you know, providers like Nicole and that you just validated what I, I sense to be one of your great qualities, Bo. Uh, so Bo's a member of CO Form 2, Keith's a member of CO Form 1, and, and Michael, for full disclosure, is a member of CO Form 4. We have some great members in our forums and we appreciate all of them and it's an honor to get to serve them the way we do, Ed and I. And um, um, so, uh, Keith, anything else you want to wrap up with? Appreciate you all. Uh, the insurance information that Nicole and Bo provided was great. That was good. Uh, I want to talk with you, Bo, about uh, yeah, our well. policy. So I liked what uh, like what I heard there. That's good. Good, good, great. And Michael Clark, thank you again. Jeremy, you were great. Jeremy, uh, ethical hacker. I've never met one, so it's an honor <laughs> to meet you. Well, I'd like to see the real full definition of that first, but uh, before I could trust you, we can't trust anyone, right? Trust nobody, I think you said. I'm not entirely sure I trust myself, but we yeah. won't go into that here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah you do. I'm sure you do. And, uh, and Adafio is very trustworthy, obviously. Melissa, thank you for your work. Uh, if unless, I'll open it up for one more question or one more comment. Uh, maybe tell us if this was helpful or anybody. Clinton, good to have you. Any questions? Final final opportunity. Nicole, come see us often. You're pretty good. Thanks, pretty good. Nicole. Yeah, thank you. All Thanks, right. Guys. All right, we'll wrap up today. Thank you very much. And then thank next you guys. Month, next month on the uh, third Tuesday, we'll we'll uh, we will do. Uh, uh, b b b Here, I'll put it in the chat. Yeah. Why don't you? Uh, how the cloud can transform your business. How about that. Brought to you by Adafio. We'll have two more sessions with Adafio, and then uh, we'll see if we can't get Mike and some of the great tech, tech ventures to maybe give us a perspective from tech ventures as to what's important relative to technology, get into some of the economics that are going on with business valuations, recurring revenue, software as a service, just so everybody can understand that, because you may have an opportunity to drive your business model that way. could mean a lot to you when you could get six times, seven times, eight times revenue, business Absolutely. valuations. Yeah, killer. Thank you, Tim. Right. Thank you all. Great seeing you guys. Yeah, great. Great to have you all. <laughs>